So I watched me a video the other night from the non sequitur guys. It was called Incarceration Nation. And God, if this wasn't one of the best videos they've done in a long, long time. This may be actually the best video they've ever done. I thought it was fascinating. Uh, featured Godless Mom uh, amongst this other guy. And Kyle himself told a story about he did how he had done a stint in the big house. And it was really powerful and really interesting. So it led me to make this video, put my own two cents in. And yeah, nobody really asked. <laughs> nobody really asked me what about my own stories on the subject. But, you know, if I waited for people to ask me to make a video, I'd never make a single video. And then you guys, miss, you guys would miss out on all this great content. So, tell a couple stories, my own personal spin on the subject. First story, there was this guy I knew in Albany where I went to college, hippie kid, a deadhead. Now, people in the younger generation, I'm not exactly sure if you even know what a deadhead is. I know a lot of people have looked at me cross-eyed when I've used the word. Deadhead was a group of hippies. There was a band called the Grateful Dead from the 60s, and they were a psychedelic band. They used to tour the country, and they were really, really, really popular. And Deadhead was a group of, of hippie kids uh, who followed them with a kind of cult-like devotion. They would follow them from show to show, and they, you know, they had really long hair, and they wore the tie-dye shirts, and they were devotees of the band. And then when I was in college, it started to have a revival of Deadheadism in the 80s. And by the time I was in college in the late 80s, early 90s, it was a big thing. I knew a lot of hippie kids, a lot of, a lot of people like that, holdovers from the 60s. He was one of them, a deadhead, totally and completely harmless. Honest to God, the most harmless person on planet Earth. I could have kicked his ass. He, seriously, I bet his girlfriend beat him up every once in a while. Totally harmless kid. And what happened was, one time he was at a dead show, and he brought a sheet of acid with him, and he was selling it. That's about a hundred doses or so. And he got grabbed by the cops for selling about a, roughly a hundred doses of acid. Now, he wasn't a dealer. He was just a kid. He was hanging out at a dead show and he brought a hundred sheets of acid, figured he'd make 50 or a hundred bucks and, you know, use it to buy weed or something. He was not a dealer, and like I said, he was absolutely harmless. Wore Birkenstocks, tie-dye shirt. Hey, man, what a great scam. I mean, he was a totally harmless human being. But So he gets grabbed by the cops for selling acid. They charge him. Keep in mind, this is New York State. And in New York State, there were some draconian laws still on the books that were holdovers from the 60s. So they charge him with dealing. And they charge him with... Conspiracy to overthrow the government, which was something that was put into law late 60s. It was, it was intended to target people like the SDS, the Students for a Democratic Society, who, you know, there were radical fringe movements out at the time that were far left and they were normally hippies and they were trying to target them. So that, that law was a holdover from that era. So long story short, the guy gets sentenced to 10 years in prison. 10 years in prison. Now, he was, it was only something like six months he was to serve, and then he was on probation. But the last I heard what happened to him, very similar story to what I heard when I was listening to their video. Last I heard, he jumped a turnstile in New York City, jumped a subway turnstile in New York City, got grabbed by the cops, and they considered that breaking his probation. Got sent to New York State Federal Penitentiary for six years. Six years got sentenced to federal pen. Now, I can't even imagine this guy in a federal penitentiary. I can't even imagine it at all. It's unfathomable to me. Like I said, this kid was absolutely harmless. Wouldn't hurt a fly. He was like a wispy, a wispy, skinny little thing. And I can't even imagine what happened to him behind bars. I can't even imagine how his life got. So in that particular situation, nobody comes out ahead. I mean, you put a kid behind bars for six years like that, probably destroyed his entire life. I didn't know him past a certain point. I only heard about this story at a later date. But no, nobody wins on that. I understand that you need to protect the society at large, but this, per this person was in no way a threat to society at large, and he was no way a threat to anyone but himself. And you potentially destroyed his entire life, sentencing him to, to that 
draconian of a sentence for that minute of a crime. I can imagine the, the circumstances under which he sold the acid that night. You're a kid. He's a kid. You're something like 19, 20 years old. You don't think you're ever going to get caught. You can't even imagine that you're going to, you'll get caught in like, you know, you, you'll get a summons for like $1,000. As far as he was concerned, it was no, no wor worse than selling a bag of weed. It wasn't a dealer. So I can understand draconian if you're trying to like, you know, bust up a drug ring. But in this particular case, it was way out of proportion, way out of proportion to the crime. And no good was served. Nothing good came out of it. Potentially ruined this kid's life. Now, second story. Uh, my one critique of their video, and actually Kyle corrected himself, but originally he was painted like these people in prison are, you know, these really nice guys, took care of them, and they're really tolerant with him and all this, and I was like, listen to that. Well, you know, I know some other types of people who were, were behind bars. See, back in the day, I had been in and out of rehabs back in my 20s, and uh, I knew a lot of people who had been to prison because... Again, New York State, same idea. You were faced with a choice. Oftentimes, if you were arrested on a drug charge, you were faced with a choice. You either go to prison or you go to rehab. So there were a lot of people who were potentially criminals, actually. I knew a lot of criminals, people who <laughs> honestly should have been behind bars. Uh, not every single solitary person in, who is serving time is a good human being, even when they are good human beings. That's why I'm telling the second story. It gets really, really, really complicated. So check it out. There was this one guy I knew, Patrick, and I met him at rehab. And he was a scary-ass motherfucker, man. He was a really, really kind of a dangerous human being. Now, I like this guy a lot. Yeah, it was weird. I was actually friends with him. Um, he was really funny, really, really, really intelligent. Black dude. Uh, really scary though. He told me, and I believed him, though I never saw him do it, he told me he used to do a thousand push-ups a day and a thousand sit-ups a day. And I actually believed him because if you saw him, he was built like a tank. He was, he was about 5'11", but he was freaking really, really, really stocky and athletic. It was like being friends with Lawrence Taylor. I mean, the guy was like, the guy was like an animal. He was a ferocious human being. Now, I liked him a lot. Like I said, it was weird in rehab. We had kind of a posse and he was in it. And under the circumstances that I knew him, you know, I got along with him really well. And we were actually kind of chummy and friends. Um, I'm weird like that. If you know me on Twitter, I can get along with almost any, t any person under the sun. And this is one of those examples. He was always nice to me, so I was always nice and kind, and we kind of had a cool relationship, but he was a scary-ass human being, and he was a very, very dangerous man. He was a sociopath. As smart as he was, it was really sad, because I know where he grew up. He grew up about a mile down the road from me, and this probably won't mean anything to you. He grew up in a town called Yonkers, but Yonkers bordered on the Bronx, so he effectively grew up in the hood. And it was literally about 15 minutes from where I grew up, and I grew up in a, in a prosperous suburb. And I promise you, if he grew up in my town, that kid would have wound up in Ivy League school. He was that bright. He was really smart, really, really charming, funny, witty human being. The context in which I knew him, he was perfectly, perfectly agreeable, decent human being. But there was an, a side to him that was really scary, and I knew it pretty well. Every once in a while, he'd pull me aside and tell me really, really dark, scary stories. I don't know why he would necessarily do that. But he would. He would pull me aside and tell me stories about things that he did. He, and they were true. He would go into Harlem with his boys and they would, they would rob houses and they'd tie people up. And he wouldn't necessarily torture the people that they tied up, but people in his crew would. And he'd tell me these stories and my, the hair on my arms would stand up and I'd be terrified. I'd be terrified. On a certain level, this was a terrifying human being and he was dangerous. Why he got caught, why he was in rehab, was because he used to rob fucking dealers at gunpoint. No joke. He used to rob crack dealers at gunpoint. That's the type of person we were talking about. And Kyle was talking about, you know, these people aren't evil. This guy was not evil. But he was scary. And he was dangerous to the society at large. As much as I liked him and I recognized that there was something about him that I thought was good, there was also something about him that was frankly terrifying. Give you another example from the same place. There was this guy, Ricky Joe, Italian guy. In a way, a very, very sweet guy, honestly. <laughs> Ricky Joe, he was sweet. 
He had a sweet side to him, but again, same principle. He was a dangerous human being. I went to I went to an NA meeting with him, and I remember him going, "Use people is like family to me. Use people is like family." And he starts crying at the meeting. That's the type of person he was. On a certain level, he was a very tender-hearted, innocent human being and a broken soul. But in another way, this guy was a dangerous person too. He had no impulse control, and he was like Patrick. Violence emanated from him. They were those two knew each other, and they were always squaring off with each other playfully. But it would make you nervous because you knew they both were, they would lunge at each other and go like, ha, 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 and you knew that they were, wanted to test each other. They actually wanted to fight. You could tell. You could tell. And you could tell that there was, it, it could very possibly turn into a fight with either of them. And it was scary to watch because I, I'm guessing Patrick would have kicked his ass, but, but that one of them would have gotten hurt. That was for sure. Now, Ricky himself also do, used to pull me aside and tell me stories, and they were scary too. He would tell me about the, how he used to be you know, addicted to speed and he had a shaved head and he used to walk down the city streets terrorizing people and you could see it on him. Again, a dangerous human being. On some levels he was a good and sweet and decent guy, but on another level he was scary. If I knew these people in a different context, I would have been, I would have been afraid of them. Ricky's the type of person, if you went to a bar with him, you, even if you were his good friend, he had no impulse control. So you could easily see a night where you went out drinking with him and you got into a fight and he would fuck you up and he would hurt you really, really badly because he was that scary. Both of them were. That's the point I'm trying to make. It starts to get really complicated. If you knew them in prison and they had your back, they'd probably be really good friends. I knew them in a context where they had my back and they were actually kind of good friends. The question is, did they belong behind bars? Absolutely. Absolutely. I bet you anything... I bet you anything, Ricky, Ricky, not only would Ricky have hurt me if we had gotten into a fight, but I bet you anything he beat up every single girlfriend he had. Probably some of them really bad. I bet you a hundred dollars he did. And he probably put some of them in the hospital. Because he had no control over himself. And the, both of them were raised in violence, and they were, they were looking for violence, and they were dangerous. The last I heard of Patrick, I don't know if it's a true story, but I heard that he kidnapped somebody. <laughs> and I believe it. I believe it. I, I, on a certain level, these people were scary to know, and on a certain level, they belonged behind bars. Now, the question is, is Ricky a good human or is he an evil human? I don't know. It's tough to say. Only, that's why only God is allowed to judge people, because that's just too complicated for you to even wrap your brain around. Obviously, there was trauma in his life. He was probably raised in a way where he only knew violence. But that's why I'm saying it gets complicated. It's really hard. It's really hard to wrap your brain around. Do those people belong behind bars? Absolutely. Because I knew them well and they were dangerous to the society at large. They were dangerous.